The Lord your God has chosen you to be his people for his own possession out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you, literally again, delighted in you, and chose you, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loves you. Why did God choose you? That's the question John Piper answers from Deuteronomy 10, 14 and 15 in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on February 22nd, 1987. Let's go to Deuteronomy 10, verses 14 and 15. These two verses are the focus, first of all. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love upon your fathers. And literally, that's the Lord delighted in your fathers to love them. That's where I get the idea of pleasure. He delighted in loving them and chose their descendants after them, you, above all the peoples, as at this day. Now, notice two things about this text. First, why does Moses describe the election of Israel against the backdrop of God's ownership of all things? You see that? Verse 14 says, to God belongs everything in heaven and on earth. He owns everything, everybody and everything. Then verse 15 says, yet he chose you for his people. Now, why did Moses in writing this put the choosing of God's people against the backdrop of God's ownership of everything? Isn't the reason to dispel the notion that God was in any way cornered or hedged in so that he had to choose this people? Isn't the point to dispel the current idea that each nation had its own God? Israel had its God. The Canaanites had their God. Egypt had its God. The Babylonians had their God. And that's wrong, this text says. God owns all those other gods. And he owns the Egyptians. He owns the Canaanites. He owns the Babylonians, which means he's free. He can make himself the God of any people he chooses. He could choose the Babylonians. He could have chosen Egyptians to accomplish his saving purposes in the world. He didn't have to choose Jews. He's free. He owns the world. If you own all the buildings in downtown Minneapolis, you can put your office in any one you want. If you own every people in the world, you can choose any people for your special purposes. Isn't the point of putting the election of Israel against the backdrop of universal ownership to say he chose you freely? He didn't have to choose you. He's not locked into being your God. He could have made himself the God of the Canaanites. He could have chosen American Indians to get his purposes started. He was free. It was nothing in the Jews. It was no ethnicity. It was no faith. It was no virtue. Abraham was a moon worshiper in Ur of the Chaldees when God came to him and chose him from all the peoples in the world. So that's the first thing to observe in these two verses the contrast between the universal ownership of God over all peoples and his choice of this one people freely. Now, here's the second thing to notice. In his freedom, God set his love upon the fathers. I want to focus on that word love. God set his love or he delighted to love the fathers. So when he chose Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, I take that to be the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and and then the patriarchs. When he chose them, he was freely setting his love upon them and was not constrained by their Jewishness to do that. It was free. 
He consulted his own wisdom. He didn't consult their distinctives and virtues when he set his favor and love upon Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, there is a passage in the New Testament that describes how God did this to explicitly make his freedom obvious. Well, it's obvious with Abraham because Abraham is out there doing his own thing, not knowing Yahweh, God, and God comes to him and chooses him of all the men in the world that he could have chosen freely and draws him to himself and makes him then the father of all the faithful. But what about Abraham's seed? Abraham had two sons, Ishmael and Isaac, and God freely sets his favor upon Isaac, not Ishmael, to continue his saving purposes. Then Isaac has two sons, Jacob and Esau. And while they're still in their mother's womb, God says the elder will serve the younger. Before they had done anything good or evil, he sets his favor upon Jacob, not Esau. So that through Jacob, he would continue his saving purposes. Now, why is he doing it this way? This is exactly spelled out for you in Romans 9, 10 to 13. Why is God doing it this way? Paul says he's doing it this way to make crystal clear to the whole world that he is free in all of his saving choices and in all of his election. So when he sets his love upon the fathers, as it says here in Deuteronomy 10, 15, he did it freely. Now, let's look at another text in Deuteronomy where this freedom of God is made even clearer. It's chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. Deuteronomy, chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. And I'll read these three verses, 6, 7, and I think we'll read 8 as well. For you are a people... Holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be his people for his own possession. Out of all the peoples that are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love upon you. Literally again, delighted in you. And chose you. For you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath which he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand, redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Now, this text teaches the freedom of God even more clearly than the other one. Look at the question that is raised for us in verse seven. In verse seven, this question is raised. Why did God set his love upon you. And verse 7 tells us why he didn't. Well, he didn't do it because they were a great people, numerous people. They were small. They were an unlikely candidate. We're going to see that God is always turning the tables on human expectations so as to frustrate Man-centered boasting. He chooses the weak, the despised, the lowly, the unsuspecting. Why did he, though? That's why he didn't. I mean, that's not the reason he did. What is the reason he did? Well, two answers are given in verse 8. The first one is, he set his love upon them. It says, because the Lord loves you. Now, that's amazing. Remember what the question is from verse 7? Why did God set his love upon them? And the first answer is because he loves them. He loved them because he loved them. That's what I mean by the freedom of God. If somebody asks you the bottom reason why God loved you, the answer is because he loved me. 
If you seek in yourself a reason for why God set his electing love upon you, you oppose the work of God and the purposes of God. The first answer in this text for why he set his love upon the fathers and upon Israel is because he loved them. He's free. There is a second answer, however. It says in verse 8, second part, because he was keeping the oath which he swore to their fathers. Now, does that mean that God's choice to love and save was constrained and not free? I think the people in view here at this point are the people at the Red Sea. And he's talking about the exercise of God's love in redeeming them out of Egypt and of making them a people for his own corporately. Many of them were unbelievers. He's talking about a corporate election here for them to be his special people that he would work with through the Old Testament. Is he constrained to save them at the Red Sea? No, he's not. The oath of blessing that's referred to here in verse 8 when it says he's keeping his oath was made to Abraham freely. God came to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis and just made him a promise. Told him what he was going to do with him. And then God confirmed that oath to Isaac, not Ishmael, because he was acting in freedom. And then he confirmed that oath to Jacob, not Esau, because he was acting in freedom. And when he gets to the Red Sea, he is still free. He did not have to save that people at the Red Sea in order to keep his oath to Abraham. Why not? Because John the Baptist said he can raise up from stones children to Abraham. You remember what was happening in John the Baptist's day? They were saying, don't tell us there's wrath coming. We have Abraham as our father. He said, don't begin to say you have Abraham as your father. There's no security in having Abraham as your father. There's no security in being white or black or a church member. There's no security in being a Jew. God can raise up people to fulfill his promises to Abraham out of stones. Don't boast in your ethnicity. Bank on free mercy, which God exercises for his name's sake. God was free at the Red Sea. God is always free to fulfill his purposes. His fulfilling his oath to the fathers was an extension of the same freedom with which he made the oath in the first place. So I conclude from this little glimpse at the Old Testament is that God chose this this corporate people, Israel, to use them throughout the Old Testament for his purposes, to prepare for the coming of the Messiah. And he chose them freely. And he chose them for his glory, to make a name for himself. Isaiah 43, 7, I have created Israel for my glory. Isaiah 43, 21, I have formed them that they might declare my praise. Now let's go to the New Testament. What happens in this whole area of election when there is a shift from the Old Testament to the New Testament? Well, the first thing to remember is this. God ceases to deal with a corporate group called Israel, at least for a time he does. It says in Matthew 21, 43, he will take the kingdom away from them, Israel, and give it to a nation producing the fruits of it, namely the church. A hardness has come upon Israel until the full number of the Gentiles is gathered in. Today is a day when a door of faith has been opened to the nations, God no longer is electing an ethnic people like he elected Israel at the Red Sea and made them a corporate political people for himself. What is he doing? Is he electing anything today? Indeed, he is. 
God's election today is His drawing into the church people who will be saved. He sets His favor today upon individuals and brings them to Himself in faith and destines them for glory. Now, the first text that I want to take you to is Luke chapter 10, verse 21. Now, let me give you the background first. The 70 disciples have been sent out on an evangelistic mission. They have preached all over the place. And they have come back so excited because demons have been cast out. People have believed and it's thrilling. And they report to Jesus who had taught them, equipped them and sent them out. And here's the response that Luke gives. Verse 21, Luke 10. In that same hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Holy Spirit and said, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to babes. Yes, I affirm it. Yes, Father, for such was thy gracious will, or more literally, for such it was well-pleasing. To thee, or NIV may even be the best, for it was your good pleasure so to do. Now, this is an amazing verse for many reasons. You know why it's amazing? I don't know of another verse in all the Bible. There may be one, but I don't know of another verse in all the Bible where the whole Trinity gets together to rejoice. You see this? Jesus is rejoicing. It says Jesus rejoiced, but... In what power is he rejoicing? In the Holy Spirit. So I take that to mean that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is filling Jesus up with joy. And then at the end of the verse, the Father has good pleasure or is pleased in what he is doing. Now, what are these three divine persons so happy about? They're so happy because God the Father has hidden something from wise people and revealed it to babes. God has exerted free, sovereign choice in whom He will reveal what to? What is it that is being hidden and being revealed? Verse 22 gives the answer very plainly. No one knows the Son except the Father. So nobody is going to know who Jesus is unless the Father opens their eyes and reveals it to them. And verse 21 says... He is not doing this for the wise. He is doing it for babes. So when the 70 disciples return from their evangelistic mission and note they are on an evangelistic mission. People who rejoice like Jesus rejoices in God's sovereign election of whom he pleases evangelize. They come back from this evangelistic mission and Jesus soars with gladness and says yes to God's election. To hide it from some and reveal it to others. God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are so bent on glorifying the grace of God that when God the Father uses His wisdom and His power to display His grace on whom He pleases in a way that will confound man-centered expectation, they rejoice. You do see that, don't you? That God uses His freedom to confound man-centered expectation. Surely it's the wise who will grasp the gospel, right? Surely it's the wise, the intelligent, the educated, the highbrow, the well-born who will recognize their God when He comes. Wrong. Wrong. Just the helpless. Just the helpless. 
God turns the tables on human expectation. Why does He do that? You know why He does it. But let's let Paul tell us why He does it. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31 as we draw it to a close this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 to 31. Here's the question I want you to ask as we read 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 31. Ask, what is election designed to oppose? And what is election designed to promote? All right, ask that as we read. Consider your call, brethren. Not many of you were wise... You see that? There's Luke 10, 21. Exactly the same point. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many of, of you were no, of noble birth. But God chose. Here comes election. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. This is what I think Jesus meant by babes. Even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made Our wisdom, our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now, can you answer that question? There are two purposes for election. Something is being opposed. Something is being promoted. The first purpose of election is given in verse 29, very plainly. That no human being might boast in the presence of God. The aim of God in election is the elimination of pride. Boasting in who you are by status, by education, by the exertion of your will, by your faith. Election is free. So that all human boasting in men and self ceases forever. That's the first purpose of election. The second purpose of election is stated positively in verse 31. Since by God's power you are in Christ Jesus... Since Jesus is your life, your wisdom, your righteousness, your sanctification, your redemption, He's everything to you. And by God, you are in Him. Therefore, don't ever boast in self. Don't ever boast in men. Boast in the Lord alone. That's the second purpose of election. So God has two purposes for election. To humble man and exalt Christ. To take all boasting off of men and put all boasting onto the Lord. To make men feel their dependence on God totally and to magnify the glory of His sovereign and free grace. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series, What Makes God Happy, with a sermon titled, God's Delight in Loving His Own. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.